it's live. All right. Hi, everybody. We are going to wait just a couple minutes to get a few more people in here, and then we will get started. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we ask that everybody, if you could please mute yourselves and turn your video function off down on the bottom left corner of your screen. Um, that way we give most of our attention to our two speakers. And then we'll get started in a few short minutes. I see Deborah there. She is so supportive. Hello, Linda. I'm trying to figure out how to turn my video off. Nicole will, t will help you with that. Yeah, there's, if you look at your screen, there's a bottom bar and the bottom left, it'll give you a function to say stop video. I see that most people are clicking off. Great. You might want to tell folks again. It's a little confusing. It's not the norm. Okay, we've got a good crowd. Thank, thank you, Linda. Yes, of course, Jeff. And no, I see the last last second. No worry, no worry, Jeff. I know it's important to you, to Deborah. I see uh, Catherine there too. Kathleen and Anne is online. Celeste. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to ask all of you uh, uh, outside of Earl's, Earl, Nikki, and myself to just close down your camera if you don't mind so that you can have yep. a better chance of seeing Earl's magnificent uh, photographs. Okay, and this is live on Facebook, which is great. Nicole, why don't you please introduce yourself and let's get this started. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole. I am an ADO intern here in Redondo Beach with Linda. Um, we are getting started today with our conversation with award-winning photojournalist Earl Daughter. He's going to talk to us about his life as a photographer, the dangers of asbestos, um, the dangers of exposure to workers and what the U.S. needs to do to protect those who work in hazardous jobs. Uh, for everybody that's just joining us, we are asking everyone to please mute yourselves and turn your video off, which is down in the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, at the end of the hour, we will have a Q&A where everyone can ask Earl any questions you have. We will cover those questions in the order they're received. Um, on the bottom right side of your screen, there's a chat box function where you can type your questions and we will send them to Earl. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to Linda, who is the president and co-founder of ADAO. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole is a fabulously talented intern who has worked for ADAO for almost three years now. So we're very lucky to have you, Nicole. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, I am Linda Reinstein, a mesothelial widow and the co-founder of ADAO. I want to thank you all for joining us today. It is really terrific to have you join us for our fifth uh, event, online event. Of course, this one is particularly special to me. It's with award-winning photojournalist Earl Daughter, who is also a dear friend and colleague to so many people who are on this call right now. Um, Earl's work has been nothing, nothing less than amazing. He's been able to capture photographs of the asbestos man-made disaster since the early 1900s. So it's going to give you an opportunity to have a really sharp window into what other people felt before ADAO really came on the scene. Uh, for those of you outside of our world, 40,000 Americans die every year of a preventable asbestos-caused disease, yet imports and use continue. And Earl, you allow our work and our collective story to be heard around the world, which is really fabulous. I am going to share my screen for a minute here and uh, start with some uh, slides for the day, which I think everybody would be quite pleased about. If, if you'll be patient with me. So one of the tricky things about ADO is we do everything in-house, which means we do it the simple and, and hard way because we, uh, we save our money to do great work. So we don't have a lot of uh, help. 
that being said, uh, I want to first start by thanking our ADO leadership, uh, of course, the ADO Science and Prevention Board, and many of those people are on this call today. Uh, our work is made possible by the generous generosity of individuals and sponsors, which really is is really fantastic. Obviously, our sponsors and donors have allowed us to sponsor Earl's uh, badges exhibit for the past six years, but they also help us with our uh, congressional staff briefings and uh, co our conferences and various other work that we do for education, advocacy, and community support. Um, the platinum sponsor, I want to start with gratitude towards Simmons Hanley Conroy. They are our largest donor, and I believe John Simmons is on today. And his great grandfather was actually a, um, a pipe, a pipe uh, I think an insulator. Uh, gold sponsors are the American Federation of Teachers and Motley Rice, and we thank our gold sponsor as well. And then we have our, our early Lucarelli, uh, Sweeney, and Meisenkoten. Omez and Weitz and Luxembourg as our silver sponsors. And of course, the International Association of Heat and Frost for our bronze sponsors. So with, with those generous donations, we're able to put on uh, the program of today, but many, many other things that helps shape public policy. Uh, there's an exciting opportunity for those of you who are on our last one. There's eight days left. There's a great campaign. Not only does it raise funds for ADAOs, but OMAZ is actually driving awareness to our work. And your donation gives you a chance to win a week in Hawaii with three guests, airfare, hotel, and spending money, which would be fabulous. So as far as ADA goes, we are the only nonprofit working in this space on prevention and policy for all asbestos caused diseases. Um, and that is obviously important to all of us. We, we, yes, although my husband and aunt died of mesothelioma and so did, did Larkin's father-in-law, um, we believe all asbestos caused diseases should be eradicated. So our work is very broad sweeping. We're quite pleased and we'll talk about it more during the PowerPoint because Earl has been a significant partner in our work uh, that the bicameral Alan Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, our ban was introduced by Senator Merkley and Representative Bonamici uh, in March of 2019. And in November, it's really exciting. It passed out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee with a vote of 47 to one. And yes, you heard me right, 47 to one. Uh, and it's been ready for the House, uh, House floor vote for months. However, one trade association opposes the bill as written, and it has caused this lengthy delay. I'll be talking about that uh, probably in writings tomorrow. There is good news. There's overwhelming bipartisan support for our ban, and we feel confident, confident that the House and Senate can pass the bill this year. And we can talk about this more later on after we get into the, finish the conversation with Earl, but I think it's really important for you to hear from this amazing photographer. And also at the end, you don't have to really take notes. We're gonna send you a wrap up email that will have a link of how can you get the posters, how can you buy Earl's book and how can you possibly support ADO? And Earl, I have to lower this for one second because uh, I still have to let some people into um, Zoom. So I'm hoping that we can uh, get all of this other stuff going. So let's do this very quickly. So Earl, the first, why don't you introduce yourself because you have got such a great history. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, since the 1990s, I had my first opportunity to become involved with uh, the asbestos issue. Through the AFL-CIO, I received an assignment to photograph uh, Irving Selikoff on two occasions. The first occasion was in his office at Mount Sinai as he was reading uh, x-rays uh, and uh, uh, just becoming acquainted with him uh, because he was a little camera shy. Um, he actually didn't want me to take his picture when I arrived and I said, well, do, a, do, do me a favor. Um, Sheldon Samuels at the AFL wants, uh, wants me to take your picture and then he relented. Uh, but then uh, a couple of years later for uh, the Asbestos the Third Wave Conference, essentially uh, Irving's last hurrah before he died uh, at the end of 1992, um, I was given the occasion to um, photograph Irving presiding over that conference. And as you all know, the third wave is environmental exposure to asbestos. And uh, uh, it was here that I became acquainted with uh, the likes of uh, uh, Bill Ravanisi and seeing his uh, exhibit, uh, Breath Taken, uh, becoming a more informed photographer as a result, uh, and uh, also meeting 
Barry Castleman for the first time uh, as he was talking with Irving and uh, uh, Paul Safechuck, uh, the president then of the White Lung Association. So it began um, the seeds for um, the badges exhibit uh, that uh, began in 2015. So Earl, it was really interesting to me. I'm having a little bit, it's a little bit wonky about screen sharing. So we're gonna go with this for right now because I can't okay. admit people if I have the whole thing um, undone. So we're gonna go with that. Um, so let's talk about the badges individually because this was a really unique opportunity when Barry and you were emailing me, I think I was working in Pakistan and you said you had an idea about these badges. And I thought this was such a creative way to talk about the asbestos industry. So if you would please tell us how, how did you come up with the idea of collecting these badges and what made you uh, actually collect certain badges? Well these badges um, are um, what to me connect individuals who were harmed from uh, asbestos exposure in the workplace directly by, by naming the company that harmed them. Here in the central uh, uh, top row, you see a John Mansville exhibit, uh, uh, excuse me, badge, and either side are um, badges from um, uh, a company that manufactured uh, uh, commercial refrigeration units in New Jersey. Um, they all were exposed to asbestos and uh, and in this, this next row, you see shipyard workers, you see uh, uh, a, a woman who worked at Pratt & Whitney Aircraft during World War II, exposed to um, asbestos dust from brake linings, uh, a woman at uh, Westinghouse Electric in Pittsburgh, who uh, uh, made um, a variety of uh, products that related to electrical insulation. Um, and so, these badges put a human face on uh, folks who were harmed years ago, uh, but um, have uh, provided um, us, the badges provide a window to see those individuals. And what I would do is I would go to uh, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, comma, asbestos litigation. Um, I'd Google that. And if you do that, you'll see pages and pages of litigation that uh, occurred um, as a result of uh, workers uh, exposed to asbestos at these various companies. Um, and that's allowed me to understand uh, that it was very likely these individuals were uh, exposed to asbestos. So it creates a, a, a create uh, an amazing background, I think, for what, what I've learned through working with you, Earl, and it's an amazing opportunity. So it started with really a working relationship and it's turned into dear friendships. And I want to bring people up to speed so they can learn more. When they see these posters, it's not just a poster, obviously. To us, ADAO, it's a legacy event. Your, your, your combination of all the badges with uh, the, uh, the legacy of Irving Selikoff mentioned at the bottom made this a great poster for Mount Sinai when you first shared it. So do you want to go through, what was what was the reaction that you might have gotten from a few of the Mount Sinai viewers of your poster? What were their comments? Well, um, what I learned uh, was uh, from a lot of the healthcare providers, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Roger Flores, who um, is chief of the uh, thoracic surgery department at Mount Sinai, and who sees asbestos uh, victims regularly and uh, tries to put them on a healthy path. Um, uh, their reaction uh, was uh, perfect to me because they said, I humanize the individuals who have been exposed to asbestos and uh, make them accessible to others who uh, might see the common ground that they possibly could share with them. And uh, for instance, the 9-11 responder uh, heading to Mount Sinai is part of the medical monitoring program there. And every year they get a physical uh, and uh, the toxic soup that they were exposed to contained asbestos as the two towers fell. Um, all the elevator shafts in both buildings and uh, uh, the first floors of uh, first 40 floors of Tower One all contained asbestos. And so um, it, uh, uh, it educates 
individuals uh, about uh, their work circumstances um, that they might not have been aware of. You're right. Your work does humanize the man-made disaster, but I think it also forces us to feel, think, and and understand that we have oh. caused this and we have to clean it up. So it's it's a really powerful medium. Uh, this Harvard exhibit, I thought, I know Ann Bacchus is on, I believe that's her in the background here. That was a special opportunity for me because I got to see you in action um, as a photojournalist, but also when we were able to co-present at the public School of Public Health. And your first exhibit was, I think, a, a, a strong success. Do you have any takeaway moments you want to share? Well, uh, I've been affiliated with uh, the um, uh, Harvard School of Public Health uh, Education Resource Center as a visiting scholar for 20 years now. Uh, and um, this badges exhibit was um, uh, one of many exhibits that has been presented at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, widening the network of, uh, of uh, opportunity for um, uh, those who do specific research on the subject uh, there at Harvard, uh, students who are casting about for their future direction as healthcare providers, um, as researchers uh, on issues of importance. And uh, we know the story about asbestos exposure is still unfortunately unfolding. And um, so when we reach out to um, schools of public health like Harvard, uh, the University of Texas at Tyler, um, uh, and uh, even NIOSH um, at their um, uh, uh, offices in Cincinnati and at their lab in Morgantown, West Virginia, the badges um, brings um, life to the data that they are uh, uh, perusing every day and puts a human face on it. Very true. Mavis Nye, who you see on Facebook every now and again, Earl, she's going to be on this, your call. And when I've met with Mavis, I've actually shared your posters with folks in the UK. So not only are they for, for standing exhibits, but also for people around the world, which makes them quite special. Um, this picture, I was uncomfortable being photographed because I didn't want to be in the limelight and obviously I'm holding a sad picture, but you encouraged me to be a subject for, um, for this, this photo and it turned out to be the second poster. Explain to the, the viewers, why was this image, why did as an artist, how did you create and why did you create these two photographs? Well, partly I wanted to show your impact um, in the Senate committee that was uh, having a hearing and has had hearings over the years that you've uh, been a presence um, in. Um, and it may be uh, as an expert uh, uh, widow's testimony, it might be as a, an executive director of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, advocating for um, reform of the toxic substances uh, uh, law. And, um, uh, and so, uh, when you appeared with, uh, it's kind of in the gallery of the Senate, Senate briefing with uh, pictures of Allen in 2016, when he was, it was 2006, when he was still a pretty healthy man. And then later when he was severely impacted by mesothelioma, um, I thought that you really stood out in this crowd of uh, Dow Chemical lobbyists that were right behind you, uh, and it was a worthy picture subject. Um, and I think before or uh, after the hearing, uh, you were invited to uh, speak with um, uh, Senator Boxer. Uh, you had under your arm the flag and photographs, and um, uh, I love this kind of situation. It was a command performance. Senator Boxer ordered me to take this photo. And so um, I was proud to do it. Uh, you, you, you made a lot of uh, uh, just remarkable, you've helped us make a lot of remarkable steps and capture them for later. And then this is what the final poster looks like. So this is obviously the second iteration of your poster. Once again, you use the badges and, and a center photograph and uh, we've shared, we've widely shared it. 
let's take a look. So your exhibit, you can see, I don't know if the, the viewer can see well enough. Here is a picture of Irving Seligoff. And if you go around, obviously that's the second poster and you'll see other images from your exhibit. These, these, these traveling exhibits have been very powerful, Earl. Um, I, I, I wanna touch on them for just a second. I mean, it, it must be a prideful moment, but at the end as your exhibit started to grow, did, could you really, could you see a different uh, reaction from the viewers? With the well, as time change changes, the exhibit changes and evolves. Um, and that last poster, um, you saw a badge from Johnson and Johnson, and that is a story that has evolved over the last couple of years. And now Johnson and Johnson is discontinuing the manufacturing of a key product, um, their talcum powder. That uh, it has turned out has been contaminated with asbestos, uh, and so the story evolves. Um, and um, ch people change. And uh, sadly, um, uh, you know, we, we've lost some folks along the way. And um, this is a picture of Mary Lynn and uh, Bracey Burrell. They're significant because Bracey was an insulator with the asbestos uh, uh, heat and frost insulators union, as was his dad, Clarence Burrell. And Clarence Burrell's litigation uh, opened the floodgates to plaintiffs like uh, Bracey and thousands of others. Um, and in Clarence's um, legal action, uh, Irving Selikoff, his one and only time testifying for a plaintiff was for Clarence Burrell. And it made a difference. Um, uh, and uh, you can see this heavily used uh, industrial insulators, uh, uh, insulation contractors badge that was Clarence's. Um, and uh, with Linda, we were able to travel to visit with Mary Lynn and uh, Bracey. Here Bracey is showing his dad's uh, insulators toolbox and the tools that uh, his son has so faithfully kept in remembrance of his dad. Um, it was like a museum. And uh, then Mary Lynn brought out a, uh, a book um, signed by Paul Bordeaux, um, uh that, um, uh, you know, the title of the book says this story about uh, uh, the Johns Mansfield Company. And here's a typical panel from the exhibit that shows uh, one of Clarence's first ID photos uh, with a, um, uh, a refinery in Texas, which was also the site of uh, asbestos exposure, their marriage photo. Um, uh, Clarence was a family man, uh, his large family, that we're gonna see a little bit later, um, some um, maybe 60 years later, on a photo at the University of Texas at Tyler. And, um, Clarence kept a cigar box with all key documents related to his uh, work exposure and uh, his uh, uh, deteriorating health. And in it were um, the dues books from the Heat and Frost Insulators Union. Uh, and, um, uh, and so this is a typical uh, panel from uh, the badges exhibit. Yeah, and obviously <clears throat> Clarence Burrell, because he, well, you can see in the bottom photograph that you were able to retouch and kind of salvage, I think, from the family photo, you can see his, he's holding his Bible. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He he went to church regularly. He was the perfect person to stand up to corporations and say, you did this to me. It wasn't my lifestyle or cigarettes. Not that that should ever be an argument in a courtroom, but uh, you did a beautiful job on this panel. Um, let's go. Let's go to the next one. So obviously, with Earl, I think it, you is so touching. Earl, is you just don't take pictures. You build families. And at the end of working with Bracy, who was here, and then Mary Lynn, they, it was like a museum. We took a, uh, had one of their family members take a picture. But we really build relationships with the people, which make to me so special to meet other asbestos victims. Um, well, let me uh, let me just interrupt for a second. Um, I want to show you my first camera, uh, everyone. Uh, this is a Pentax H3V, a manual camera with a 50 millimeter lens. My uh, School of Visual Arts instructor insisted that I use a lens that approximates the sight of your normal vision. So in order to be, be photographed, you have to be in a speaking distance with your subject. No stolen photos, uh, no sneaky business, 
you had to establish a relationship, a personal relationship with your subjects, let them who know who you are and why you want to take their picture. And if you were lucky, the favor was returned. And the favor was returned with the Burrell family in spades here. As you see, they came to my exhibit in Tyler, Texas at the University of Texas at Tyler. There's Dr. Jeffrey uh, Levin who invited me uh, in the smock and uh, the sisters of Clarence Burrell and grandchildren, uh, all there in honor, uh, some for their uh, great grandpa, uh, their uh, grandfather and their brother. Yeah, yeah, and that panel is beautiful. So the good part about this after, if people are interested, they'll be able to go back and take a look at your life's book. We can talk about that in a little in a little while and see some of these panels. Well, at the same time, after we finished meeting with the Burrells and they were so momentous, we did travel down to Florida to meet with an icon uh, and, a, and a hero of mine. Uh, Barry Castleman is on this uh, on this Zoom call. So he also knows and many others. Uh, Paul Berdor was a leader. He wrote in the New Yorker magazine back, I believe, in the early 70s, all about the Clarence Burrell case, but really about the outrageous misconduct by the asbestos industry. And this picture, I won't get any awards for it, but I took this picture of Earl because I think uh, you can see how close Earl is with Paul Berdor, who was a pretty, pretty big character. Uh, when you got to sit there and, and have a discussion with Paul, do you have a, do you remember anything that, that really kind of captured from the Burrells to Paul Berdor that you want to share? Well, I remember after being there for a while, um, uh, our presence made a difference. Um, Paul Berdor ended up coming to the next um, ADAO conference in 2016. I think our personal presence made a difference. Uh, not only did Paul come, but Mary Lynn and um, uh, uh, Gracie, Burrell came, and there's a host of other luminaries there I won't also name, but um, I just happen to see in the left there, there's Dr. Raja Flores, um, uh, who is uh, a, a very important supporter uh, of ADAO uh, and Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Mount Sinai. Indeed. So this gives you an I, the viewers an idea of what your exhibit looks like at our conference. And I think it's beautiful how, Earl, you place the badges, photographs of the badges above, and then you have individual panels. Uh, so while our conference attendees can be listening to our speakers or getting ready to listen and perusing the 150 page program, they're also surrounded by your photographs. And then Tony Rich's really excellent uh, historical um, uh, memor memorabilia, I guess, historical articles, because not really memorabilia because it's all killer materials, but it gives your viewers an idea. And these panels are put together by you, your wife, Scott Schneiderman, Nikki, and others. You must stand back and really look at your work and go, wow, I did it. I made it. I'm telling these stories. Well, it's a team effort. Um, I'm getting up there, uh, turn 77 next week, um, actually this week on Friday. And, um, uh, and so um, it's a cooperative effort. Uh, my wife, Deborah Stern, has been a loyal supporter of my work and is out there uh, in the evening helping me uh, set up the exhibit, uh, helping me travel to uh, distant locations uh, um, and meeting with uh, uh, folks like uh, ADAO supporters. And I see next to you, Linda, on your uh, left is Mike Matt Muller. Um, uh, it's part of the story. Um, Deborah and I uh, went to uh, um, Mike and um, uh, his wife's uh, home on the occasion of their first uh, uh, child's, an only child's birthday, uh, Riley, their first birthday. And so there's a personal uh, touch that expands out from uh, this, um, this involvement that uh, uh, when, you, when you're involved with a subject over a period of time, the depth keeps growing. And uh, that's important as a photojournalist, not to be uh, treating a subject with a superficial um, look. And you've been doing this so long with us now, the actual number says asbestos kills 15,000. And now with new recording, we actually say it's nearly 40,000, which is tragic. So uh, in this briefing, and it was wonderful to have you come and photograph our uh, various, I, I think maybe it's five of our Senate House and, and 
both sides of the aisle briefings, but I know I see Brent Kynock, he's not in this photograph, but he's to the left of Mark Caitlin. Then you have Barry Castleman, Mike obviously, and dear Andy Egregious, who used to be the executive director of Safer Chemical. And then you also have Daniel Rosenberg from NRDC. So we bring in the so-called usual suspects for a briefing and you're able to capture these images that are, are so important. Uh, this briefing is with Anna Marie Kearns on the left and Julie Gunlock, and Julie's holding up toxic chemicals that came from Tony Rich, who's also on this call. What made you take this picture, Earl? Well, uh, I was hear hearing the personal stories of ADAO uh, supporters and individuals who have their own uh, mesothelioma or asbestos um, uh, uh, exposure stories. Uh, and both of these individuals have been standouts in support of uh, uh, banning asbestos. Um, and um, they are vulnerable. And, uh, um, and maybe you can tell uh, some of the details of folks who have lo been lost in the last five years, uh, Linda, who um, uh, were avid supporters of ADAO and uh, uh, are now dear memories. Yeah, of course, Paul, Paul Zigabom and uh, Michael Bradley and so many are all you know from Facebook also, but Julie and Anna Marie are amazing warriors and I love when they do our briefing and I think it's because of those who help to speak at our brief, briefing that we're able to participate and then have, have a photograph with Senator Boxer after the Toxic Substances Control Act uh, amendment, which is called the Frank R. Lawton Bill, was finally passed. Senator Boxer was able to take a bow and Earl, you captured her bow. She's kind of- Yeah, and she was so prideful, <laughs> Linda. Uh, it was a pleasure to take her photograph uh, because she hosted, hoisted that uh, heavy frame up and boom, the picture just came about so quickly and directly and there's President Obama's signature um, right there. Uh, and with folks like uh, Boxer and, uh, and Obama, uh, things happened uh, that moved uh, the uh, reform of uh, the Toxic Substance, Substances Control Act forward. So we're going to move a little more quickly because we could talk for probably about five hours and I know we're going to keep it to an hour. So um, this is your end poster, which was great. We were able to share it with members of Congress uh, and others. And once again, your badges frame it so beautifully. I want to take a look at this one because um, this, this was what I think was a really tough one. So let's run through these pictures, if you would, please. Top picture. What you're saying uh, is uh, Pat Morrison against uh, the Twin Towers, uh, who uh, it looks like one of the towers had already fallen. Um, and below is a member of the Firefighters Union, which uh, Pat Morrison, as Health and Safety Director, represents on Ground Zero uh, as uh, a grappler machine, opens up the pile, and uh, this firefighter has the sad duty of looking for human remains. And the remains of firefighters, some 343, lost their lives on 9-11. Um, and so Pat Morrison is not only an advocate for firefighters, but he is an advocate for uh, banning asbestos. Um, uh, it, and with 9-11, uh, with that was the ultimate environmental uh, exposure, ultimate third wave exposure for firefighters and um, so many other uh, emergency responders who've lost their lives since. Yeah, and I think for ADO, we really must stop for a second and let um, the trade unions know how important they are and how much we respect them because trade unions actually started this war on asbestos back in the late 20s. Uh, and if it wasn't for labor standing up, labor unions standing up for their members, there would probably be far more deaths and more use. But firefighters, AFL-CIO, the insulator unions, so, teachers unions, so many others have taken a stand for their members, but also for the nation. Um, this trip to 9-11, to you and I both went down to the World Trade uh, Museum to capture photographs for this upcoming poster. And at the time, Earl, we don't really know, I mean, it's your poster, we don't know what you're going to see along the way, so we kind of fill your camera with unique uh, images. And this one is from Ground Zero, obviously. And then yeah, the girder is being hauled out uh, that um, uh, each and every responder and their uh, particular uh, fire companies, their particular local unions, signed this girder. And um, it uh, is uh, a, a uh, 
a source of tribute to all the re uh, re responders who uh, uh, did the good deed of uh, uh, responding to that uh, emergency call, and many uh, sacrificed their health uh, in the in the process. Um, and so this uh, this uh, image in the 9/11 um, uh, uh, Memorial Museum stood out to me, and uh, I had taken a picture earlier as this girder was being hoisted out of uh, the pit. Right, and Raja Flores, you've stayed with it. So obviously Raja Flores, is, I think he might be on this, this call too. He's amazing on our science advisor board and you've got old and new. You wanna to touch on that and then we're gonna to go to- Well, uh, Raja is proudly wearing his badge from Mount Sinai as uh, chief of uh, thoracic surgery. And he's looking toward a, a worker, a laborer, who uh, is the benefit of uh, the 9-11 uh, Mount Sinai Medical Monitoring Program. Uh, he's uh, having his health checked uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and, uh, and so um, this was a, a, a double um, um, itinerary visit to New York City. Uh, we, uh, I think we first went to Mount Sinai and then to the 9-11 Memorial Museum. And the, on the agenda was a hard picture to look at. Uh, uh, Roger Flora, Dr. Roger Flores at work uh, with a, a mesothelioma victim, unfortunately uh, an open and shut case. A, a, a sad uh, outcome of that surgery. And at the end, we have this uh, photograph. You called it asbestos fighters, firefighters, emergency responders, and caregivers. Um, and this was our third, or third or fourth, fourth poster. But um, and it comes together so impactfully, Earl. Well, thank you. Um, you Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so this is another briefing and people can see Raja Flores all out of his scrubs and, and Bob Sussman on the far left and EWG, uh, Scott Faber. Of course, Mike, Matt Miller was a great voice, a strong voice, so dedicated. And uh, Pat Morrison, so your briefing picture, you start with some, you never know what you're gonna get. But I think for me as a friend of the Matt Mueller's, the photographs you took of Mike are probably some of the most important ones that you did capture. Mike at a briefing, and I'm sure that you, you saw him speak a few times, but I think you really saw him grow into his skin when it came to being a voice. Absolutely. Deborah and I were at uh, the Asbestos uh, Disease Awareness uh, Banquet in 2015, and we happened to sit uh, next to Mike and his wife, um, and um, here's a healthy man with a beautiful young wife, and he said, why are you here? And he says, well, I'm a victim of uh, idiopathic exposure to asbestos. In other words, uh, no explained uh, route for the asbestos that uh, was beginning to impact in them back in 2015. Well, uh, the family became friends and uh, Deborah and I were invited uh, to uh, uh, visit Mike um, uh, on the occasion of uh, their uh, daughter Riley's first birthday. Uh, and. Um, we it was a happy, proud uh, occasion for them and for us to be there. Um, uh, but the story goes on. M Mike really grew into his shoes as a passionate um, uh, advocate for as the asbestos ban. And here he is before um, Representative Tonka of uh, 2017, um, not so long ago. And um, telling the story in a way that really uh, uh, lets a representative like uh, uh, Representative Tonka know that uh, this is serious business. Um, unfortunately, Mike has uh, recently passed, passed and um, uh, we, we've lost a powerful friend and advocate and uh, I'm proud to say I knew him. It was remarkable. And just to touch on idiopathic, I want to make sure that when somebody says that for Mike, I think he was struggling with where exactly did his exposure come from? Because it could be environmental, it can be take home, it could be home repairs. So he had exposure to develop mesothelioma. And then I guess you have to trust a, a very good law firm to figure out where that exposure comes from. But we know it's all asbestos causes mesothelioma. At the end, you produce this really strong uh, 2019 poster and it's progress and challenges. And I have a love this one even more now with Mike and you can see the end and I'm sure you you feel 
very proud of this one too, Earl. Well, the pictures um, almost take themselves. I'm so glad to be present at the briefings. It's my own education. I figure out uh, picture taking strategies uh, like uh, following uh, uh, Mike and uh, Jessica Mattmuller home for their uh, daughter's uh, first birthday and uh, then hearing that Mike is uh, testifying uh, and uh, speaking before uh, representatives in the House of Representatives and I wanted to be there and so these pictures come about as a result of uh, the activism of uh, key uh, experts um, like Raja Flores and Pat Morrison and Mike Mattmuller. Uh, they speak from the voice of experience. Yeah, another briefing, there's Brent Kynock. I don't know if he's on this call, but he has been uh, you know, a very strong partner with the uh, Information, Environmental Information Association for a ban. You can see our dear friend, Andy Egregious, of course, Pat Morrison, and Barry Castleman, who is always there. And the lighting of this picture is, is quite strong and, and beautiful in a, in a strange way. Well, this is an ideal uh, Senate hearing room for uh, taking pictures that involve uh, PowerPoint type presentations because the light balance is uh, equal on the screen and on the presenters. And so it allows me as a photographer uh, to capture it in a beautiful kind of Rembrandt kind of light. Um, and uh, so for me, it's a task to make the pictures convey artistically as well as uh, informationally. I want to draw people into these uh, subjects and the graphics that are presented uh, uh, by ADAO are telling and uh, uh, provide uh, education to the broader public in a meaningful way. Well, you do that. Um, this was a fun one for us to work on together. And again, when you started working on the poster, you weren't really sure what's gonna happen. You take so many beautiful photographs along the course of a year. And this was, we, ADO, I'm really proud about this part because how do you talk about an invisible killer fiber? If you can't, you know, see it, taste it, touch it, spell it, you don't know the people, it's very hard. So I've been using art and advocacy for a long time to try to create a better narrative of, of so people understand. And this was really a wonderful time because Dr. David Michaels, who's fabulous, uh, we'll just be hanging up on that person, um, allowed us to screen the movie Breathless, which is a documentary about um, Belgium manufacturing of asbestos and then how it's sold in, in India. But you got to see Gopal in India with Dr. David Michaels and Bob Sussman doing a screening at George Washington for the first time we had a powerhouse like Dr. David Michaels. And that was, and you captured it, Earl. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's so important to uh, command the ag advocacy of experts uh, like uh, uh, Dr. David Michaels. Uh, I worked with him uh, since the 1980s when he was uh, working with uh, Workplace uh, uh, um, WISH, it was the acronym, I can't get the exact title, but um, uh, we went together uh, to laundries that were uh, this uh, place where uh, laundry workers were getting needle sticks in the uh, be beginning of the HIV AIDS crisis. And Dr. Michaels became a respected uh, advocate as leader of OSHA during the Obama administration and uh, now at the Milken School of Public Health at uh, George Washington University. And so we are proud to rub shoulders with uh, individuals like that um, during these screenings and other occasions. Yeah, so the whole weekend was filled with art, advocacy, and academia. So the march, you captured so many. I know you used to tell me about the lighting. So why don't you share that Julia is, is making her poster on the left-hand side, and then we all marched together from the kind of over by the Lincoln Memorial to the Capitol with conversations. But you captured some very somber and tender photographs. As well, it, it began um, at the site of the ADAO conference when uh, folks like Julie Gundlach uh, were telling their own story uh, about um, a relative uh, they had lost and uh, uh, the woman holding uh, asbestos killed my dad is from Ambler, PA. Her uh, mother, Marin Marilyn Amento, um, lost her husband and uh, this young woman lost her dad. Um, and so these, um, these, um, this artistry um, uh, personalizes the story and it happened to be a somber rainy day. And 
I love photographing uh, occasions when the light um, uh, reflects the message. Um, a bright sunny day wouldn't have cut it for this kind of a story. And um, so I had the, the opportunity uh, to photograph outdoors, uh, folks with their umbrellas uh, in the rain uh, telling their story. And you can see the vividness that uh, this soft light allows um, the group to just uh, shout out at you in a meaningful way. And not only did um, it uh, reach my camera in an effective way, but folks who they encountered, uh, these uh, demonstrators for uh, an asbestos ban, provided a safety and education a message about um, where you might be exposed to asbestos, whether it's in your home or your school, um, in the atmosphere. Um, and um, so on the way to Capitol Hill to speak with uh, politicians, um, uh, more stories were told and uh, the message was spread wider. And there you see Judy with, uh, excuse me, Julie with her, uh, her, the sign she created. Tell me the story of Julie's uh, asbestos uh, 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 background, uh, uh, Linda. Yeah, Julie Gunlock is a mesothelioma patient. We call ourselves warriors, whether you, if you've been impacted by asbestos. I don't like to talk about exposure because I'll be honest, I, I might not, I might get something confused and it would leave it to the industry to try to say something was wrong, but I believe it's take home, but I'm not sure. But that's Julie and she's been a survivor for I think about nine years, maybe 10, and she is a remarkable woman. But you've got all these photographs that come together so beautifully. Now, uh, for those uh, of you who haven't been to our conference, uh, and of course we had to cancel this year's uh, because of COVID-19, uh, we will discuss later on how you can grab um, this year's poster, which we obviously will have to print, uh, and then hopefully distribute and, and raise awareness, because this is one of my very favorite ones, Earl. You did a magnificent job. Let's switch for the, the few minutes that we have. Let's, let's talk about your life's work because yes, you started in the 90s with AFL-CIO getting into the asbestos work, but you started far before that. You started and tell us about when you started and what's in your book. Well, the book was published in uh, 2018 and in 1968, I began my uh, photography at the School of Visual Arts. Um, and since then I have created uh, many exhibits and in this book are 13 of them. Uh, and um, the badges exhibit uh, is one of the most extensively illustrated in the book. Uh, and if you bear with me a minute, uh, uh, this, is, this is the opening page of the book, uh, of the chapter, and uh, it uh, tells the story that's reflected in the exhibit. Um, and um, 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 I'm, I'm very proud that it's included here. Oh, it's beautiful. You have Dr. Castleman uh, viewing your work at AFL-CIO. The, the installation was just, it was really- yeah, this, was the, this was the opening event for the book uh, in September of 2018. So I see friends here. I see Rebecca Rendell and others and your beautiful wife and daughter, but you know, you get a standing ovation from all of us and Scott Schneider. So it's got a- Well, it was not only me, but Peg Seminario uh, was getting a, a, a standing ovation as well. She's off camera. She hosted this event uh, uh, for the launch of my book. And I was so pleased um, that the, the exhibit uh, was there in the House of Labor. Um, they have uh, been important advocates uh, for um, uh, ev uh, effective worker asbestos controls over the years. And uh, so I felt at home and um, I was pleased to get such a warm reception. As you do all the time and you deserve. And that's you in rare form, talking about the photographs in the backgrounds that you're fishing. Uh yeah, that's my Fishing Hazards exhibit, which was one of the exhibits Ann Backus and I worked on um, uh, as a visiting scholar with the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, the most, one of the most dangerous jobs uh, uh, continues to be uh, in the United States. And uh, so I love to do gallery tours. Um, uh, I love to talk about the badges exhibit um, when it's uh, on display with uh, attendees. And uh, I hear personal stories. And um, this picture reaches back to uh, uh, um, Lee Hipshire. I photographed in 1976 and it, it's being held by his son, Ronnie, 
uh, a recently retired UMWA coal miner. Uh, he's very proud of his father because this picture hangs in the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian uh, today. And uh, uh, so it was a big surprise when my daughter Rachel called me uh, the day the Mueller report uh, appeared and she said, Dad, on the phone to me, did you know your photograph was on uh, page 31 of the Mueller report? And so if you can bring the next slide up, Linda, um, you'll see uh, the uh, fake poster that was created by the Internet Research Agency when they grabbed this image from a NPR website uh, and used it for two fake rallies, uh, one in Philly and one in Pittsburgh. Uh, and um, they um, uh, were uh, highlighted uh, in, uh, in the Mueller report as a result, as a, an example of um, uh, Russian and uh, Trump-Pence campaign collusion in the 2016 election. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. And I think closing with uh, Eula Bingham before we start photographs, this was actually taken by Tony Rich, but there was such a sweet closeness between you and Dr. Bingham who just recently passed away. So um, your work just connects you to so many people and you are just um, a, a passionate person who I'm just honored. As was, as was Dr. Bingham, who I worked for uh, when she was uh, at OSHA in the Carter administration. Yeah, nothing less than amazing. So I apologize for any pinging and Nicole said people could see my emails, but that is a show on mine. So hopefully this it's 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 never a perfect thing doing these things from home office. But I think your power your slides just represent so much in the way of storytelling Earl and the relationships that you built and the talent that you have. So let's let's jump on to some questions. I'm going to go to um, Nicole's doc very quickly and close that down. Um, and then Earl, so why don't you talk a little bit about how folks can get your um, your book, which is amazing, and I'm going to go to we're going to go to Q and A. Um, my book is available through my website um, www.earldaughter.com. That's the best way. I'll send you a signed copy, um, and uh, that'll be it. Um, you'll you'll get it uh, pretty quickly. Perfect. Um, and also there will be a wrap up uh, blog that will have um, the information that will be terrific. And Nicole, I'm looking at your doc very quickly, Q and A. So we've got some questions that came in. So uh, it's not simple with uh, managing a PowerPoint and all the rest. So I apologize for anybody that had to see me go up here and actually uh, uh, admit certain people. So uh, one question that came in, which is probably um, really terrific, or I'll touch it, it'll touch about your life's work too, is how did you become interested in asbestos workers? Well, it's, it's a long, um, long story that uh, began with um, meeting Irving Selikoff. Um, and uh, this man was an asbestos warrior. He used his professional reputation to lobby Congress for what amounted to the first uh, uh, and most effective uh, reduction of asbestos use in the United States. Um, uh, it was everywhere, uh, in our attics, uh, uh, in our ships, um, and uh, all forms of insulation. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning. And um, you know, with Barry Castleman, um, years later, I had shown him these badges and I said, we have to figure out a way that these badges can end up becoming an exhibit. And um, what happened was that um, um, Barry's brain started to whir. And about a minute later, he said, you know what? Uh, Excuse me. Uh, January 2015, Irving Kitselikoff uh, would have been 100 years old. Okay. And so we realized that this exhibit that could use the badges, the workplace badges, um, could commemorate the 100th uh, birthday of Irving Selikoff. And so that was the beginning of it. Uh, and then a phone call to Linda made it happen. So after working with us for six years, what's your message for Congress? You've seen it all. You've seen the love, the loss. There's no cautious on. Well, I, I hope that um, 
the the travail of families like the Matt Mullers um, and so many others uh, uh, can be seen and felt uh, in a more direct way um, with uh, the visual part of the story that uh, ADAO has found so important over the years. Um, and uh, uh, it has given me a long-term access to an important subject um, that uh, uh, I feel uh, committed to um, and uh, won't stop. Well, it's an honor to work with you. So I am sure I'm seeing some lovely messages and there's even a, a happy birthday early one, Earl, in here. But I'm, I know people are going to want to get in contact you to buy your poster and your life work. And your life is so rich with meaning and purpose, Earl. Um, it's truly an honor to work with you. And you've carried our stories tenderly, not only through the camera lens, but also in your heart. And so has your wife, Deborah. Well, thank you. Um, what would you like to tell any of us as asbestos victims? Do you have, you've seen us go through a lot. Well, um, you have stories to tell. And uh, just like uh, Bracey Burrell wanted to tell the story of his dad, uh, you may have uh, important visual artifacts uh, that relate to the exposure of a family member. Um, uh, you may have photographs of your loved ones who have been lost. You may have pictures of them as they are attempting to overcome this disease. Share them with me and we'll think about ways that they might be incorporated in future badges exhibit uh, to keep the story going. I'll put that in the blog. They can reach out to us and then we can, we can you and I can um, some rally around the flagpole, so to speak. Um, Earl, I don't know what, what the 2021 poster is going to look like. It's been a tough year for everybody. And I think uh, especially for AFL-CIO and many others on this call, COVID has been um, the top priority as it should be. Uh, but we're going to, we have a lot of time left, still five and a half months to move the R-band bill through the House and Senate. So I am really hopeful that when Congress opens up, that with your camera and your knowledge, we can go through those, those quiet halls and take photographs. So in five or 10 years from now, your work will be seen by even more people because you've allowed us to tell our story and we want to get this so, so, so done and signed into law. Well, earlier you mentioned a roadblock uh, uh, to the legislation. Uh, do you want to talk any more about that? Uh? Well, yeah, I'll touch on a little bit. So it, it is frustrating when there's one trade association that basically, and it's pers a, a, some, a group on our so-called side, it's not defense, and they are uh, working on um, uh, changing uh, elements of the bill for their members, which puts the bill, um, has delayed the bill. So I'm hopeful that with um, broad discussions that they will recognize that the bill is so good and so strong and that they should support it. If not, we're still going to move it forward. But um, Dr. Kalsman and so many others, Arthur Frank and Richard Lemon, and you know, you've seen the list. Um, many organizations, attorneys, general, and others all support it. So we're hoping very much that we can move it forward. And we still have time and no one's giving up and the House wants to move their bill and the Senate wants to pick it up. So that's a good, good place to be. Okay. Well, I just want to quickly uh, uh, give a shout out to Dr. Arthur Frank, who I uh, first bumped into at ADAO, then in Tyler, Texas, uh, when my uh, asbestos exhibit traveled there. I saw him present in the most compelling of ways. And then I was invited through his auspices to uh, bring the badges exhibit to Drexel University. Uh, that was my hometown, it is my hometown. And so it was a special honor that uh, uh, Arthur Frank afforded me. And uh, those contacts I met, met in, made in Philadelphia um, continue uh, on today. And I'm so appreciative of his commitment to uh, visualizing the asbestos story. But you're a remarkable man and a brilliant photographer. And thank you for giving this time. And if we have to go back and fix any of the video because of all the lead in stuff, we will definitely get this all completely right because it's probably one of the most important conversations that we had. Thank you for giving us the time and thank you for believing in our stories and sharing them, Earl. Entirely welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. Everybody should watch for a wrap up um, and how you can buy Earl's posters and book and all the rest. Thank you, Earl. 
Bye-bye.